It's a very interesting film, actually, if you ever have the time to see it, by Tom Kamp, who teaches in Hamburg, now Art Academy. Um, you can tell that he also uh, is a close reader, not only of Pynchon, but of various people who um, became associate, associated by that time with Pynchon, like Kittler, who makes an appearance in the film at one point, Selman does it work. Spirit. So, um, for this case, especially, it's a film I recommend, but we can't watch it in its entirety. Um, the section that I was finally able to um, wrestle down so that we could see it um, at least um, uh, fills in um, some of the technical details um, of the launching. I think it's interesting that we see that it's a whole scenario. Um, one of the earliest uses of television on the test site, uh, and a kind of um, incipient um, computing uh, was also uh, put into place. Um, the theorization of feedback and negative feedback, so crucial to the onset of cybernetics um, on all sides of the war, um, was also part of this um, invention. Um, the metaphoricity, the, the oven, the curtain, or veil, um, all of that is something the film uh, goes into particular, in, goes into in particular as a kind of um, anticipated, projected crypt, um, in addition to the losses that we've been talking about, um, uh, built into the foundation of uh, rocket flight. Um, the film um, gives us a sort of wraparound perspective of the losses uh, attending um, this uncanny piece at the same time of continuity, um, something that continues to uh, reach to the um, outer limits um, uh, of our own scientific uh, explorations. Um, and um, it's our, uh, it's been our work uh, for the last uh, couple of days to identify um, uh, what is along for this uh, uh, drive or flight um, and to um, uh, consider um, the various relations uh, that go into um, uh, its, its seemingly continuous history uh, a continuous history of um, progress um, into the stars so um, I would like to um, uh, take a break now. Um, we actually did a, I should find it before I touch it too much. Um, they did a study with, um, there's a lot of studies in, in sort of um, our, the, the way we perceive caricatures and the way we sort of identify, yes, identify each other and the way that we sort of process only little pieces of a person at a time. And this, the specific study that I'm thinking about that I find really interesting is they had, um, they had seagulls that were yes. raised in um, captivity, and they made like a um, like a de very detailed seagull. Like, so seagulls had never seen their mother, their a real other seagull mother, um, and they made a very detailed seagull puppet to try to feed the um, the baby seagulls, and they wouldn't take it from that. And then they took put like a little what was it like a beak on a stick? They did. They just took the very simple, most basic elements of the seagull they could, and the baby seagulls went for it. And if you look at the way that our visual systems and perceptual systems develop, the way that you know we can identify two dots in a line as a face, mm -hmm. um, and to put, because that's sort of what we process when we look at somebody's face. You know, there was a lot of research into facial recognition, mm -hmm. um, and also said that it happens to be a specific part of the brain that triggers with looking at faces as well that we look at. So. So we have this, pro this processing power of just of reducing um, mm -hmm. things to those details, which is why character is working. Good. Given that, and I'd also fold into that Donna Haraway's uh, uh, study on uh, early primatology and the kind of anthropomorphic identifications with a towel rolled up with you know two dots in a line that a monkey will identify with, uh, not having seen any other animate uh, creature, uh, rather than simply a towel. Um, so, given all that, why? What's it for? Why would such a thing appear on, as, in, what? Um, I 
have more to say on it. Oh, please don't, 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 don't hesitate. Please go ahead. Um, the other thing is, uh, is the, what it runs, this may or may not be specific to your question about robust, but I just wanted to extend mm -hmm. this idea, um, which is, I get um, Scott McLeod, the comic book writer, he wrote Understanding Comics. I don't know if mm -hmm. he has this idea of sort of this, is he has this, the, you know, the step from the really basic and open to the universal and to place we can. It's just two dots in a line, it can be anybody, and it can be ourselves. You know, I have two dots in a line in my face, right? Um, and so I can put myself into that, into a stick figure more easily than I can put myself into a photograph, you know, a photographic representation of somebody else. So I think this is enough basic elements, and obviously, you know, some people don't have eyes and that, you know, but there's just enough so that I can say, like, yeah, those are things that I have too, and not so much that that I can't, that it becomes not me, you know. Yeah, so they can, Bill and his characters always have the most distinct character traits, like the yeah. traits of the face and stuff, so you don't get that out of them. Yeah, yeah. And then what? Your point is, is, is very good and very well taken, but then, and then what? Uh, you know, one, once we've accomplished that and you know, facial recognition is, is certainly one of our earliest accomplishments as, as infants. We, we do that, and we do, do it very, very well. Uh, it's also the case that, that uh, neurophysiologically, we, the first time we will meet someone, we're quite attentive to their physiognomy, to that, that face, to their body, to gesture, body language, disposition, all of that. And subsequent times we meet them, um, yeah, it's just a kind of neural economy. They're, they're schematic. They are like you know, stick figures in a way. Unless there is some salient uh, incident that, that requires them to be otherwise. So your point is absolutely, you know, the foundation. But then the question with regard to, to robots and robotics is, and then what? Yes, please. So that we don't feel threatened by them. Why should we not feel threatened by them? Because they look like us. Well, let's put it in this way: Why do they not receive into the, the visual register of the machine? or come closer, which is the problematic of, of, of Blade Runner, and become like replicants, where you can't tell the difference. And for whatever duration, whatever parsing of time, whatever interval, why do they stay there? <coughs> because they're supposed to be in our service. Interesting. Why? Why, do, why are they supposed to stay? Yeah, why, do, why, is, why are they arrested? In that way, and then, and then, by the way, the, the semantic play between arrestment, appropriation, apprehension, uh, and service comes into play here in a very interesting way. Why keep them there? Why keep them at a distance, if you will? Why put them in the service quarters? This may Please, not, yes, this may not cover all the robots you show, but another um, form of identification uh, that has been proposed and studied, other than the wounding one, the way. Um, would be based on the evolutionary notion of the mm -hmm. And so it's the simplicity of the images that bring us back to the um, features of youth, especially babyish features, <coughs> secret of the success of making us. Yeah. Um, because the, um, the theory is that um, this keeps us from destroying them. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. taboo against yeah. destroying yeah. children. Right, and, and it, it actually gets <laughs> yes, the biblical strange children. And it goes back to, forgive me, I don't know your name, but it goes back exactly to your point about, about caricature, that there is something about caricature and, and neoteny. How is it the case that, that uh, we can look at a caricature, uh, and that uh, and neoteny is a, a very common trope within, within caricature, uh, and it works very well. The, the identification is, is, you know who it is, you know what it is, you, know, you get it, uh, it works very well. But you can look at, for example, uh, an identity kit for forensic uh, identification purposes. You put the biometrics together just a little bit wrong, a little bit off, and it looks either uh, erroneous or, 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 or monstrous, and you very immediately don't get it. In other words, simply it doesn't work. So the question about neoteny is a very interesting one, and especially apropos of robots. The one robot that I pointed out that asks a question, a little question mark in the eye, was one of the uh, godfathers, if you will, of uh, robots like Kismet. Kismet uh, designed with Ray Harryhausen, a, a special effects guy, uh, is designed to have uh, 
neurotonic features. Big eyes, uh, big lips, uh, eyelashes, cute expressions. The whole category of, of, of the cute is, is non-threatening. Dogs. Uh, animal husbandry has bred dogs. Uh, toy dogs, lap dogs, chihuahuas, etc. Name, name the breed from a uh, base stock for certain features, and some of those features are the, the, uh, are the apnea, the retention of uh, adolescent features. Um, they're cute, uh, and we don't kill them. So that, that whole thing leads to you know, other questions apropos the android. If you pose the question, is a dog an artifact? How do you attend that question? It's not the, the, the baseline uh, canine, but the, the, the incredible perfusion of shapes and colors and behaviors that, that form uh, that whole tree are absolutely a, a, a consequence of our intervention of uh, animal husbandry. So it's a dog, an artifact. Yes, please. Oh, I don't know if I can but the, um, what Larry was just saying about what, I think Sophia about Thank you, Sophia. Um, about, you know, they look, they don't, we don't bring them um, up to all the, yeah, so that we don't destroy them. I think it's also so that we don't destroy our, ourselves, so that we don't become obsolete. Um, and I think that if you look at um, all of, almost all of the, all of the, um, <laughs> very realistic robots that we can't distinguish in um, in literature and film in culture are threatening. It's always it's always the, the too the too much reality threatens the human race and they become autonomous, autonomous and autonomy autonom 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 and they really but they really threaten the way that we operate and we become told and it's, and it and it becomes real, real I and mean, we have you know computers replacing humans everywhere but and um, and stuff like that. So so we don't sort of convince ourselves that we're completely obsolete. Um, well, along those lines, uh, that, that particular species of, of android robot that you see marching along in the metropolis, I assume either you've, you've seen it at some point or you've shown that that, that clip, becomes very interesting because, uh, when is it, 1922, 23, where the word robot enters into a kind of common national parlance through um, uh, a play by Kyle Chompik called uh, UR, Lawson's Universal robots. And the word is Robota, Robotnik, which are cognates in German Arbeit and Arbeiter. With a slight difference. Arbeiter means worker, Arbeiter to work. Robota, a Robotnik, mean one who is consigned to work for the state, an indentured servant. There is an authority inscribed to the very name, Robota, a Robotnik, and it's where the English robot comes from, and uh, both the, the German cognate is the same this place. Well, it comes back, of course, in, uh, in Metropolis and in other places. But uh, that sense of it, you know, what what could Chopic have been thinking? And this is where a very close reading of that play would be very, very interesting. A very close reading of the um, Props and sets and, and stage design for its various incarnations are very interesting because in that there's also a case of a certain kind of history, a certain attendance to a body, an attendance to a certain proximity to and from <laughs> the human being. Um, at a certain point in that kind of trajectory, notions come in like that of a Turing test, and you all know the Turing test. Um, they're all over the place, that kind of test. Um, artificial intelligence has a very interesting take uh, in, in its sort of uneasy uh, engagement with robotics. Uh, robots such as, as the ones we've looked at. By the way, they're all real robots. No Japanese toys, no Hollywood costumes, no uh, dress-up suits. Those are all real robots. Um, they span from the earliest is 1922, the latest uh, 2009. So those were all portraits of actual robots. Um, I'm just going to ask, do we all know what the Turing test is? No. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, well, I will not go into the mathematics, but it is a formula as well. But it has to do with 
Uh, Karen, you know what a Turing test is. You want to jump in with that? No, no, this is your class. You started I started it. <laughs> okay. I just meant the staging of the test. It's oh, the staging of the, 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 the test. Okay, well, let, let's just then, without sort of throwing ourselves head over heels into one deep end or another one, let's just say that the common representation of the Turing test is that it is a form of uh, interrogative discourse in economy whereby you determine whether or not the entity with whom you are engaged is human or not. Mm -hmm. This is how it's inscribed into ever so many science fictional uh, situations. Mm -hmm. So for our psychoanalytic purposes, the test begins as a way of figuring out the difference between gender. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then the woman is replaced by a machine. Turing stuff is always gendered uh, in, in the myth film. Do you also notice that the well, the two big films that I can think of when the artificial intelligent machines that man the ships, when they go wrong or they always become more feminized. When they turn evil, they always seem more feminized. I mean, like, like I think Hal, for instance, when he loses it, he sounds more like a desperate lover when he talks to Dave. Mm -hmm. And then the he has the this feel to it. And then um, I always think Colossus sounds like the mother. Like the uh, unforgiving mother. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this feeling of these these all knowing machines that when they when they turn against humanity they become this like jilted lover, overbearing mother. I don't know, these are always the or things. The that voice I'm of the robot, the breasts of the Terminator that, yeah. is, that we, we do and have in Robbie, Robbie the robot and um, Forbidden Planet yeah. is immediately identified as uh, like a mother. Absolutely. <laughs> when the yeah. are going down the voice it announces okay. that we're going to be crashing into the female. Yeah. Yes. As I've talked one enough, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So this position of, of the female voice already artifactual. You know, that if you're on a, a telephone or an announcement or, or a loudspeaker, um, you know, it's not your mom's voice when she calls you. Hi, honey. It's an artifact. So, yeah, yeah the, the artifact relative maternal is this made to attend to yes, just, just, to, just to close off the um, digression of the footnote. And the result, of course, is that you can't tell the difference yes. between artificial intelligence and the human subject. However, this is the part that I love in the description. Uh, it says that um, but if telepathy exists, <laughs> and there is a lots of evidence that he's acknowledging that telepathy exists, um, then it would have to be possible to construct telepathy proof rooms for this experiment to be imaginable. And then um, he can't stop himself. He says, and if we begin to accept telepathy, then the leap of ghosts is not far away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh, that's something that's really interesting. And, and, and you, 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 have to, you absolutely have to see that in, in, in the background of a certain kind of phantasmata or the return of the phantom, because that said, you know, uh, uh, in the wake of if you will, the, uh, the kinds of experiments that occurred with the London Society for Psychical Research, who were published under the title of Report on the Census of Hallucinations, an attempt at collective uh, accounts of revenants and, 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 and appearances <coughs> and ghosts and guests and, and all these things, uh, in an attempt to take these narratives and, and investigate them and put them onto a kind of scientific grounding to see if there was telepathy. Um, and it also, by the way, uh, generated a series of instrumentalities, instruments to uh, verify, to, to, to secure, capture evidence, that's sort of like spirit photography uh, a, bit, a bit earlier, but devices uh, that, um, for example, uh, early television. Uh, experiments with early television were, were considered uh, in, in terms of uh, a device that could either induce or block telepathic emanations. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have the electrification of uh, a site or, or a region, whether it's rural United States or, or, or Japan for telegraphy or telephony or whatever, there are attendant series of possessions and hauntings that, that occur. And, and the sorts of possessions that occur in the telephone system in Japan are in an entirely different demonolog demonological uh, order than, than those that occur in well, Kansas. So, you know, those things also 
So that relationship between the, the kind of uh, uh, gender indecision of a Turing machine <laughs> and the phantasmatic. Sorry? Do you have some examples? Examples of? <laughs> Japan versus Kansas. Yeah, there are actually examples. There are, there are, there are books that, that uh, account for them. Uh, Jeffrey Scans has a nice book on haunted media. There's a, um, uh, the London Society for Psychical Research collects tales on, on the West. There are uh, things in Japan, tales where uh, that whole sort of order of uh, figures, demons of, of various sorts, uh, take up residence in technological networks. Uh, there are uh, sort of uh, occult and popular cultural books, uh, ever so many, that, that uh, offer evidence, claim to offer evidence of telephone calls from the dead. Uh, there are, um, you know, uh, evidentiary traces of what you find when you play ferric oxide <coughs> and you use a pitch transponder to, to go in there and, and work it and uh, like uh, the Beatles album played backwards, you see who's really talking to you. <laughs> so, so there are all, you know, any number of, you know, and, and, and to what ontological status a Turing test of one sort or another, to, to what gender, to what uh, disposition do we ascribe these things? Certainly, there are all you know. There, there is a, a taxonomy out there waiting to be uh, counted and studied and, and addressed. Uh, In regards to just sound and music, uh, the work of David Tuke on haunted, the haunted medium of uh, listenership is yeah. also a good direction. Yeah, that uncanny uh, disposition of sound, sound, sound in warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, this is the phonic register of. Of sound, uh, a certain kind of incommensurability. Uh, you know, when you take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum, when you look at the assignment, <coughs> assignment of frequency allocations, it is a map ostensibly of uh, every territory, every national boundary, every sovereign, sovereignty uh, on this planet. There is no way to get from its cartography to a cartography which is recognizable uh, as such. Uh, assignments in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, even though uh, they suffuse uh, our, our physical coordinate system, you can't move from one map to, to the other. So uh, what happens in that spectrum is, easily, is, is also not locatable, but for a kind of almost Benjaminian technical intercession, uh, radio receivers, uh, and so on and so on. So an interesting kind of uncanniness that happens there. But yeah, all of our devices are susceptible to being haunted. Now, who do you want to haunt your device? Uh, the notion of you know, every cell phone you guys have in your pocket has a GPS uh, configuration, whether it's enabled or not. So the, the condition of ambient findability, whereby no matter where you are, you can be located, has to do something you know, to that very you which can be located. So what happens to that you? Well. Another kind of possession, don't you think? But another kind of haunting. Um, well, I don't know where we are time-wise. You guys want to take a break? Do you want to, or should we just plunge ahead? Just plunge ahead and just stop her. Okay. Um, the, the three things in your presentation that, that, that really caught me and, and really uh, I think were very effective were affecting me as well. Um, were the notion of restitution, the notion of repair and recuperation, and the notion of integration. And, um, you know, the question I brought up was actually a very interesting question. I brought this up with uh, Michel Foucault at one point as well. We were talking about, about uh, uh, technologies of the self, conditions of subjectivity, uh, and, and, and all the attendant very things that, that, that you can imagine, and the question of what sort of subject would be required, or would be uh, sort of tacitly positive, put forth, deposited, dispositive, in the practice and the technology of denazification, which also appends to all those things, to, to integration, recuperation, repair, uh, restitution. And what happened was really very curious, and what continues to happen is really very curious. And, and, uh, I would, I would defer uh, to you and to the, the stunning work on Nazi psychoanalysis as, as uh, a touchstone for all of that. Uh, but you know, those documents are, are out there. You know, they're, they're just about the point where things are becoming declassified. 
uh, you're getting access to that. There are still people who are involved uh, who now have robust academic positions still and are still accessible, who are involved in those programs and procedures, developing those programs and procedures and psychologies. Uh, and they are absolutely out of occlusion, out of sync with any kind of uh, psychoanalytic or philosophical uh, dialogue. It would be very interesting to give a poke in that direction. Is there a hand up over there? Somebody? No. So, um, among the forms of, of, of integration, a uh, friend of Ron Brown, pretty sure, that, that was an amazing film. Uh, and, and watching that was absolutely <coughs> for all sorts of reasons. Um, an odd little bit of biography here. What you're looking at here is uh, something called the uh, XN62.2. It's a nuclear powered aircraft. It was, uh, as it turns out, this is, this is biographical because uh, <coughs> my partner's father was the scientist, and he was a nuclear physicist and an engineer in charge of the project. He had 800 people uh, working under his guidance to design, build, test, and fly the nuclear aircraft. This information, not all of it is declassified, you can find some stuff on it, you can find stuff about it. Uh, the earlier instantiation, there were two uh, nuclear aircraft built on uh, consolidated B-36 airframes. Uh, General Electric did one, consolidated with the other one, uh, with the Air Force. Um, it's an interesting project because uh, your father is Norwegian, uh, an atomic uh, scientist, as <coughs> a nuclear physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project, and who became uh, the lead the project director designer for the nuclear aircraft. It flew. It flew once. In 1961, which is when this, this is the V2, this is not the one that flew, it was uh, a different earlier version. Uh, in 1961, John Kennedy canceled that project. Why would you need, he reasoned, an aircraft that could go up and would not have to come down? But actually, you know, it was something to go from point A to point B, and everything was put into intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, a couple of strange things about the atomic aircraft, uh, and there's a kind of visual cascade of stuff to show that have to do with uh, integration and recuperation, and, and a certain kind of pressurization, too. Um, there are some things, <coughs> this is a quick digression, there are some things you can't do anything with. Uh, we have in our possession uh, an 8 millimeter film. It's somewhat stretched and, and damaged and, and uh, dyes have faded. It's a colored film. And it shows uh, Leslie's father uh, standing around this, uh, the pit where the atom bomb is, is kept. And it's hauled out onto the tarmac. This is on the island of Tinian. It's an atoll. It's very flat, so it's very windy. The wind is blowing. And the tarpaulin snaps off the ground, comes out, and it, it, it flaps up there. And uh, her father was told by one of the uh, officers, uh, although he was a high-ranking scientist, his military designation was as, as a technical sergeant, so he was told by one of the go hold that down, go fix that. So he, he, you see him, the friend took the, the, the camera, you see it in the little spurts, he walks up to the bomb, grabs the, the tarpaulin, uh, realizes that the grommet is, is broken, he can't secure the tarpaulin over the bomb, so what does he do? Sits astride the bomb as it's driven out to the Enola Gay. Turns out he's a man who has a curious and dubious distinction of putting the last bolt in the atom bomb, but it's that trajectory that you can't do anything with that is such a, a bizarre uh, image because it's uh, exactly the figure of Slim Pickens and Dr. Strange thought, yee-haw, <laughs> let's try the bomb as it goes down over Russia. Nothing at all you can do with that. Uh, anyway, this is um, not publicly available. I actually have the painting, um, the artist's rendition of the atomic aircraft. It's not been published, it's not been declassified. You guys get to see it. 
There it is. Why was the painting made? Was it for a popular science publication? Uh, actually, you can see a lot of stuff. No, it was actually internal. It was, uh, it was for General Electric. And it was uh, along the lines of, uh, you know, when you go to the National Aerospace Museum, you go to San Diego, you go to the Smithsonian, you'll see paintings, artists' impressions of prototypes, whether it's spaceships or flying saucers or this or that or the other thing. And the whole history of this, is this kind of sort of imaginary uh, um, uh, technology, you know, blueprints for things that have never been built and so on. So really quite interesting. This is one of them. Um, but along that line of integration, uh, recuperation, repair, all those sorts of things, uh, Operation Paperclip, you actually can find a bit of declassified information on that. What does that mean whereby uh, Nazi scientists were distributed, and particularly in the United States, and they built all sorts of things. Uh, the airframes, uh, the blueprints, the drawings, the doodles that people found ended up uh, becoming a whole generation of missiles, guided missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, jet aircraft, uh, the shapes, the forms are, are uncanny in their resemblance and in, in their in their outplay. So there's a, a whole sort of taking up of that, whole integration in, in a different way. And what's happened curiously in the last couple of years is that uh, in the register of military history, there's a, a fascination and uh, in, in investment uh, with what Niall Ferguson has called virtual history. Ferguson is an interesting case. He is an historian who invites other historians to write what if scenarios. A standard trope in science fiction, you know, uh, uh, from the get go. I uh, think of Ward Moore's Bring the Jubilee, uh, a, a restaging, recuperation of the Civil War. Think of any number of, of stories that have been that, that stories by Philip Dick. Um, so, military historians have generated a curious genre, taking all these blueprints and, and photographs, fragments and doodles, and building them into scenarios, into images, into models, uh, testing those models. What would happen if the uh, Sanger American bomber, the stratosphere bomber, had actually been built? What would happen if this whole register of technology, this is the Sanger atmosphere bomber, designs for which exist. People are building models of it, 3D models, CGI Models. This is what it looked like. And notice, they put it into the camouflage in use in 1945. Uh, Nazi national markings. They put it over the earth. This is just a, a small gathering. Of, uh, this is just all different representations, different models uh, by different people. Each one is by a different person of Sanger's America bomber. This is another thing, uh, VTOL craft, uh, a doodle, making 3D models out of a doodle, another one. Notice the American aircraft are B-29s. Here's a Horton uh, flying wing. They actually built and flew some of these. It's like the Northrop uh, B-46. B this looks a bit more familiar, jet aircraft that you might have seen. Uh, another Nazi aircraft, Nazi camouflage, Nazi Regalia, the, the ornamentation, the frame of paragonal disposition of these things. Another Nazi aircraft uh, design, never built, never proved, never existed. Uh, this one, based on the Messerschmitt's design P.1007, uh, it's like the American jets deployed during the Korean War. There, the flying wing, like Northrop's flying wing, must be London being bombed again. <laughs> The Lipschitz the Delta flying wing, looking uh, for all the world like X aircraft uh, in the 60s and 50s and US. Another flying wing, Horton Brothers again. So north of that. German flying saucers. Don't laugh, they have it. They never flew, they were designs, they were you know, interesting things like that. But, and here we are, back to 
the actual, you know, the painting of an aircraft that, um, there, what's that we can learn? Tom, I'm curious, do these people explain why they do this? Endlessly. Okay. Do they tell you anything? No. no. It's very interesting to read them. If you look, um, uh, I'll give you one site just to look at it because it would be an interesting thing to, to analyze. Schiffer Military Publications in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, they publish, uh, there's a guy named Myrta, M-Y-H-R-T-A, uh, who sort of uh, take it upon himself to uh, recover from, uh, and they do actually serious uh, historical, uh, archaeological, archival work. They go to uh, the Soviet Union, to uh, archives in Germany, archives in England, archives in the US, uh, not Soviet Union, they go to Russia, and go into former Soviet archives, and find all this stuff. And but so it's it, so funny because the authenticity, the focus on the authenticity, well, yes. does it really erase the, the, the question of why, right? You no, know? no, no, and, 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 and that, that, uh, the demarcation between uh, the, authentic, the authentic and a certain uh, index, a certain verisimilitude, uh, yeah, a certain what-if scenario really does transfer us into a kind of science fictional realm. You know, is there a kind of science fiction that, that had preceded uh, the tactical deployment of, of the Gulf War? In one sense, yes, indeed. I did an interview with uh, Brian Jenkins from the Rand Corporation, Walter LeCour, Benjamin Netanyahu, it was for a film, and somehow I got, uh, I didn't have a beard, I was standing there, I looked like a fairly outstanding fellow, <laughs> and I was cast as the interviewer, so I had to interview these guys, and because it was a film about terrorism and counterterrorism. And the interviews were absolutely fascinating, and there was this kind of analytic moment in, in those interviews too, where years and years later, uh, Jenkins, comes on and says exactly the same thing that in 1982 he said to me about uh, well we live in a twilight world and the conditions of the twilight world are such that we have to be vigilant and the form of our vigilance is this and what he announced was the plan that were put into play. It had been, there's a kind of precessionary uh, enunciative apparatus there because that plan had been around for a long, long time and it was put into play. So that boundary between something that, that was, you know, if you considered them as people did in the, in the 1980s as a kind of bright lunatic fringe think tank held under suspended quotes who were doing science fiction and then they put it into the Gulf War. So that, that transfer, that economy that, that you traced so beautifully, um, and, and uh, the, the, the sort of psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic register of which I'm, I'm not capable to, to address fully, but nonetheless there's a sort of outer perimeter of that, that transfer between the, the topos of science fiction and the topos of uh, other kinds of cultural deployments. <coughs> It is an absolutely crucial place to investigate. Some of these models press toward a realization, which is you know, um, something that we can consider, but then others um, don't need to be the discourse of um, psychological warfare, the gradients, ultimate grade, um, or Star Wars. Star Wars, the whole Star Wars program. program. And the whole Star Wars, it's, it's now when, you know, as an Australian, one might look at that Star Wars program. It's really bizarre. Actually, as I think of it, Sophia, uh, a point about caricature to bring up, because it also ties in with you know, this kind of military science fictional disposition. Uh, first point, uh, Herman Chernoff, is a, uh, a psychologist and a computer scientist at Harvard. Uh, if you uh, tag in Chernoff, C-H-E-R-N-O-F-F, -E uh, go to uh, www.sciencenews.org, you'll pull up uh, a fascinating article with a good bibliography. Chernoff was given a contract, a military, military contract. The problem for any pilot in any manned aircraft, this is some years ago, uh, is within uh, a space and a topology of an ever decreasing uh, interval and window of deployment. How do you, flying over 
a particular site, an enemy site, make the judgment to deploy your arsenal. If you make the wrong decision, well, you waste a lot of money. There's always a cost. You don't hit your target. There's always that. So Chernoff's mandate was, how do you shave off those fractions of a second to give our guys, to give American pilots, an edge? And so Chernoff, and this goes exactly to the question of about caricature uh, and the schematic, Chernoff decided that you know, it actually takes a lot of time to process all those things, uh, LEDs, dials, uh, progress bars, uh, numbers, all this stuff. Let's get rid of them. Gone. And what Chernoff does is develop a, <laughs> this is true, develops a system based on the iconic happy face and establishes a grammar. Each happy face has uh, not just two dots in a line, but uh, there's some nose, there are eyebrows, there, there are some front lines, all of that, and establishes a, a grammar for that. Uh, gets rid of the instrumentation in uh, jet aircraft and replaces that instrumentation with happy faces having different expressions. Because indeed, it is our, <coughs> our first accomplishment as an infinite facial recognition. And so it teaches the pilots how to use the happy faces in deploying their weapons. It works. It successfully shaves off a couple of seconds, gives them an edge. Well, the report sort of ends there because I don't know what's in the cockpit of cutting over military aircraft now at all, and nobody's really telling. Are there happy faces all over the insides of these weapons? I don't know. Um, but it's a really interesting kind of, of, of problematic. Tom, and Isaac just <coughs> reminded me of something you said. Yes? Oh, the happy faces is the first sign of the coming of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. I said that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I probably did that. For <laughs> 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 the whole other occasion. <laughs> No, 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 I, I always hated those things. But anyway, uh, yeah, perhaps there, perhaps there is an unconscious. Maybe it, I don't know. Um, anyway, that, that, so that, that whole point of, of you know, the deployment <coughs> of caricature, or the deployment of the schematic is a very, very interesting sort of thing. And it does, you know, we, we do tend to this notion of, of these sort of schematic bodies, these schematic human beings that come back to us from Iraq from Vietnam, from Korea, from World War II, and, and that, that whole history of, of that kind of return and of a kind of attendant schematism of, of that. What <coughs> kinds of subjects, whether in blue suits or red suits, come back off of that kind of field? Yes, please. Uh, I just wanted to say in regard to the, uh, the futuristic doodles yes. uh, of the, uh, the German aircraft, um, uh, there are two parallels for me. Um, first, on a personal level, that my earliest memories of drawing are of military aircraft, and I'm not entirely sure why. <laughs> um, there was nobody in my family that was in the military. Um, somehow, that uh, somehow this this idea of military aircraft entered my imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's something for me to think about more. But um, uh, secondly. Um, it reminded me of, uh, actually, of uh, Hitler's own artistic practice as depicted in the film Max, in which he finally finds his uh, outlet for his imagination through these, as they're describing the film, reverse futurist mm -hmm. um, doodles yeah, yeah. of vehicles, buildings, even uniforms. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 I, I saw kind of a parallel there. Well, yeah, yeah, Hitler, um, you know, all sorts of things about, about this sort of bodily disposition of, of, of Hitler. Benjamin at certain points attends to that, that they have a whole notion of, of, um, of a crowd that does not think, and, and, and uh, um, you know, such a figure presenting uh, a certain face of ourselves to ourselves, and all of that stuff you can research it as well as anyone. But, among those sorts of things that had a kind of technical exfoliation were uh, the ribbon mics that were designed to, to sort of render out the body of Hitler, an early cyborg, to make uh, this somewhat quavering voice uh, a 
bit more resonant, a bit, a bit more deep, the architecture of, of, of the phonic trace that would adhere to the body of Hitler, whether it was in uh, recordings, uh, whether it was in uh, a live modulation of that voice for radio. Uh, there, there's a kind of staging, a kind of um, uh, precessionary disposition to that. You see that as early as, as 1925, uh, Hitler listening to recordings of himself while he practices his dramaturgy gestures. It's, a, it's called a, what is it? It's a kirastomathy. Uh, where do you put the, the rhetorical figure for? Where do you put your hands when you speak, so as to most effectively persuade? And you know, he was practicing this, and then Hoffman takes the photographs of these, and uh, uh, the Getty has uh, has them now. So uh, you know, so that, that thing about uh, Hitler's body, uh, and it's a body which comes back again and again and again. I've read some of the stories as uh, as a nose, as a clone, as a. Um, uh, as a ghost, as a as a revenant, or or, or that, that it is the the sight, uh, the incident, the the, the tokos which occasions the appearance of other bodies. Avram David Davidson writes a science fiction story. It's in the future. Time travel has been perfected. Uh, the state of Israel has, has has grown. Jews have the time machine. What do they do? They go back to every site every scene wherein the Jew is cast as bestial, unclean, vicious, murderous, dirty, perfidious. And they enact those things. It's a disturbing story. Very interesting disturbance. Avram Davidson. Oh, Avram Davidson. What was the name of it? I don't remember the name of the story, but you'll, you'll find it in uh, the Avram Davidson Treasury from Tor Books, and, and it's not going to be difficult to find. Uh, if anybody wants to email me, you can. I'll give you the reference when it as I'm on the uh, The second thing, Howard Waldrop. Uh, again, this goes to that, that, that transfer to the science fictional. Uh, what bodies appear and, and then disappear? What is salient and, and, and what is not? What is the nature of that appearance? All those sorts of things, which are sort of the the ground for a psychoanalytic reading, uh, which I will, of course, give to you. Um, but an appearance of bodies. Howard Waldrop writes a story uh, called Ike at the Mic. Interesting story. Waldrop is a very good historian, a very good observer of uh, cultural patterns and, and, and configurations. Very good writer. I'll be slow. Uh, Ike at the Mic constructs a world wherein there is a transfer between the bodies, the identity, the being of Dwight David Eisenhower <coughs> and Elvis Presley. Elvis becomes president of the United States. Ike is a jazz musician. Man kicks it out. What happens if, as Walter does, and he's a bit obsessional about this and brilliant, you really take all of those things to their logical, logical conclusion, you really do perform at that edge where the virtual history of the actual historians is not quite as good a story as a virtual history called uh, <coughs> science fictional as if happens, and you blur that, that, that boundary and you do it in, in, in such a manner. What happens? What would happen? If you transferred Elvis to the President of the United States and Ike to a jazz musician, and he plays it out, and the story is absolutely brilliant. I will leave you with a corruptic hanging, a cliffhanger, bullet for the story. Howard Walder, Ike at the mic. Won't be hard to find. Any number of other stories? Yes, please, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'd like to stop and I'd like to ask you a question before you did. <laughs> you can ask now. No, no, or on. Yeah, on. Go on. Uh, two other things about bodies. Um, Permutation City, a novel written by the Australian Greg Egan. Uh, and even though there's a major scientific flaw, which he addresses later on, and it says, well, I got kind of fucked up. I really, you know, here's how I would, I should have done it. And he writes another book. But Permutation City is incredibly interesting because it takes that, that sort of worn science fictional trope of uh, what happens when you download your consciousness into a, a silicon matrix, you download your personality, your being, your identity, into a computer. 
And he sets up this really interesting situation. There's a lag time, a delay, a dilation, an attenuation. As you download it into the computer, things get slow. Everything slows down. So much so that there's a disparity of the possibility of communication between us, we on the outer world, cannot bridge that perimeter, and the inner world, the silicon world, which is a haven, a refuge, utopic, uh, in, in that sort of uh, Louis Marine uh, sense, or heterotopic in that Michel de Seto sense, uh, well, it's a good place in, in certain respects. The other thing that happens is, not only do these downloaded consciousnesses get slow, they get stupid. How would you know, if you're one of these downloads, that you're stupid, or that you're slow, or that there's a, a, a diminution of disarticulation, a, a falling away of <coughs> attributes, of language, of processing power, of memory, of intelligence, and so on? And how would anybody else know? It is an in, 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 in ineluctable boundary. You, you can't, in one side or the, or the other, and the boundary does not even you just can't get there. So, Permutation City as a, 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 a kind of uh, topos for a concept model is a really interesting one to look at. Um, second one, Ken McLeod, uh, Scottish writer, interesting guy, uh, hardcore Trotskyite. Somehow it makes a very interesting science fiction writer. Uh, he's smart, he, he, he takes up very contemporary uh, arguments, notions about community, notions about responsibility, notions about uh, law, um, tells good stories about it. He tells an interesting story. London. The economy is awful. The ecology is terrible. Everything's decaying. Build a virtual world. It's a little bit like Second Life, as if it were to suffuse our world. And so, people take refuge there. Um, there's a certain kind of custodial, janitorial uh, class who, who stays out in the world, kind of cleans up, keeps things working. Uh, hardly a new theme, H.G. Wells had this sort of thing, all of that. Uh, but inside this, uh, exactly in registration, coextensive and commensurate with the London which is decaying, is the London which continues to be built. And as it's built, it exfoliates its architectures, its art forms, its music, its populace, its bodies, its styles, and its fashions continue to grow. As does <coughs> the economies. If you don't have enough money to approximate the CGI holy grail of a, an absolutely convincing Turing-like realism, there's a kind of diminishment of your body. You're a little bit blurred, a little bit out of focus. And if you're really a member of the lowest class, and you don't have any money, and you're actually, in a way, homeless, you appear, your silicon instantiation within this virtual world, appears like a cartoon. You're a stick figure with a little blank white face, two dots, and a line and the register of your expression, the register of your engagements, the register of your discourse, everything is similarly truncated and attenuated. It's a chilling story. One more story. Charles Strauss, interesting guy, I recommend a number of things. Accelerando is a pretty interesting one, a halting state. But this is called Saturn's Children. Another familiar science fictional trope. Re-innovated. What would happen if we designed robots, perfected them, had really good robots, just like every science fiction, utopic, robotic story does, and then, oops, we become extinct. What sort of society would happen? Even with the this, this sort of tired side <coughs> of invoking Asimov's laws of robotics, but if we stuck that law on um, this unfortunate populace of uh, surviving robots. They continue, uh, like, like those started automata, to build themselves, to rebuild themselves. They actually have enough of, of a kind of inscription of, of attitudes 
dispositions. They have styles, they have fashions, things change, they evolve in a way at a certain point, uh, looking like human beings. Oh, that's not so interesting. They start to look like other things. They still have these imprints, if you will. They still have a certain uh, subservience, if you will, to absent humans. What do you do with that? Subservience to an absence. Oh, well, it's kind of like religion. Uh, what would religion for robots be? It doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite situate itself. It doesn't. You know. So it's a failure. Test, failure, test, failure, test, failure. Very interesting kind of Turing test. As I said, it's a Turing test backwards. Is there a human? Can we, like, recuperating the mammut from uh, this little frozen clump of, of, of cells or or a copper light up in the, in the glaciers, can we stick it into an elephant and uh, we have a mammoth again, can we stick it from a, a spear of an amber into a, a frog and holy shit, to an rex again. Um, what would these robots do? What is their set of dilemmas? It's of course never answered, but the traceries, the, the, the trajectories, the contours that are traced in that book by setting up that problem uh, in a way, they really beseech a kind of psychoanalysis. At that point, I'll take a bit of a rest. <laughs> I wanted to uh, return, uh, nearly in closing, to the question you raised about demasification. I was intrigued by it. You didn't really answer it other than to recognize that you were suggesting at first that only certain uh, capacity or readiness would uh, respond to such a process. But I, I realize that I don't even know what they did in demasification. Did they try, did they try to change the contents of thought, or did they um, address the language that had been some extent tackled with, or what kind of a process was it? You know, it's, a, it, it's a, in many ways a difficult question to answer, partly because that initial conversation early on with Foucault was uh, a conversation uh, where I, I was seeking kind of advice because I thought this is a really strange thing. This is a really strange thing set into relationship with this notion of, of, of uh, techniques of, of subjection of subjectivity that you're talking about in, in that sense, but also from a psychoanalytic sense. What is the tacit presumption in something like this? So I started collecting all of this sort of material, and, and Foucault, for his part, said, said uh, essentially, I haven't thought of that. It's a really interesting project. Uh, let me know what you do, and then he died. But, um, uh, so I've collected a lot of material. I've actually interviewed a couple of people who were involved in that, uh, in that process. And uh, people who've actually been, uh, one was an anthropologist, one uh, fancy himself a poet. Uh, they're all academics and administrators in, in a certain way. They were all caught up in, in this, and it's, um, it's a whole sort of blank field where a lot of work has to be done. What what is the sort of bureaucratic structure? Uh, the, the sort of what sort of commands? What sort of statements? What sort of, of, of uh, uh, circumscriptions? Of, you know, what is the body of an Nazi? You know, it's almost a, 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 a <coughs> reflection of the whole sort of medical discourse. Some of which we have available. Yeah, you know, I have said Sandra Gilman or, or, or Jack Zipes or, or, or people like that. Uh, or uh, that, that uh, bizarre and elusive book about uh, dreams in the Third Reich. Uh, there are some places where there's a kind of a tendency to uh, you know, the body of the Jew, the body of the populace, uh, this and that. But the body of the Nazi, aside from a kind of a, a surface, a kind of, uh, you know, the, the Hitler Jung figure who uh, is uh, given over to uh, uh, a life of, of, of natural beauty, of exercise, of training, of you know, all, all the, the, the sort of the, the gymnasium ideal. Uh, we have those, already store those images and already store of, of, of those figures. But the body of the Nazi, what, where would we find that? I don't know. It's work still to be done. Thus, Table Light argued after shortly after reunification that all that um, sudden Nazism in East Germany had mm -hmm. something to do with ways in which that was kept in deep freezes. He claimed, as he thinks along these lines, mm -hmm. that these bodies had not been in Germany since the period immediately after the war. That's in Germany. But what kind of phantoms were they that they could be so readily dismissed and so readily recalled, I wonder? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, no, no, the, the template work is, I think, extremely important, but it doesn't really quite attend to, to some of the, those basic questions, like it doesn't attend to, uh, it, while, while it may attend to a certain uh, philosophy, even a certain kind of eccentric psychoanalysis of, of those bodies, uh, it doesn't attend to what might have been happening in terms of a kind of uh, bureaucratization of that, a kind of bureaucracy of occupation that would situate the bodies in a certain way. And I don't have any work that actually attends to that. Um, and you know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of stuff is not declassified still. I mean, here we are, about sixty some years away from that, and, and there's a kind of redress of, of its status as a secret. And uh, it goes back to something that you said also about, about that history in, in, in your presentation. Um, you know, it's it's the ground where uh, that that sort of um, placing of, of the question of trauma, for example, placing of the, of the question of all those questions of restitution, repair, recuperation, redress, all those questions, uh, which, which, by the way, are uneasy and, 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 and uh, contemporary questions still. And the persistence of those questions is the most uh, amazing um, achievement of Nazi mass psychologization, um, I think, would be the Gleichschaltung, mm -hmm. this ability to um, create a, an absolute uniformity mm -hmm. of um, outlook. And uh, that, of course, depends on what contents are supposed to be, could, would be deposited in that Gleichschaltung. Mm -hmm. But to close for today, um, within the uh, orbit of our endopsychic genealogy, um, I think one noticed it. Of course, the content was benign, but also phantasmatically asserted recently. Um, I don't know whether that was apparent outside of Germany. But Germany, as a whole, without exception, decided to get rid of atomic energy. Mm -hmm. One party said, well, what can, we, can we afford it? And they were voted out of existence. <laughs> um, maybe. You know, that's cool. They're really, maybe they're really benign, but there's no such thing, really except phantasmatically and under some kind of remote yeah. control for everyone to be of one opinion. So the only thing I can add to that is um, uh, the atom bomb is the only thing um, that the Nazi Germany, Germans did not contribute to the arsenal, the new arsenal <laughs> of techno war. Yeah. So it was <coughs> that much more easily cast out. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely, a pleasure. Thank you for, for your patience and your comments. And mm -hmm. It's been I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. As we do in Germany. <laughs>